Ah, oh, good morning. How are you? How are you? Do you know someone has just put up a fake speed camera in the local village? And it's, I mean, it's obviously fake because it's like got yellow plastic on the front and not shiny, not like reflective yellow plastic. And it's slightly too small. And it's sort of just, they've just stuck it on their fence post. <laughs> <coughs> That'll be in the Kentish Gazette next week. Oh, fake speed camera. Preston fake speed camera shock horror scandal. I mean, you know, well, there's not even, I mean, it, the problem with that part of the, it's going out of the village and uh, it's the bit of the village where everybody accelerates because they know it's going to be 60 mile an hour around the corner. And it's, yeah, it's still a 30 mile an hour zone, so I can see why they get frustrated. People used to get, people used to moan at me about my hedge because I've got a, the hedge on the front of my garden. I've got a road that comes alongside the house. And the, um, what they said was that the hedge obstructs their view up and down the road so that if the traffic's coming, they can't see. But what they need to do, I mean, they just have to pull out slowly. That's all you can do. I'm not going to cut the hedge down. They want me to cut the hedge down, not not just to like four foot or anything, but to the height that they can sit, see over sitting in their car. So like they'll be sitting in the car and they want me to cut my hedge right down to below the level of their window sill, so they can see up the road and see what's coming. I'm like, well, hedge has been there since 1816. It's not about to, just because lunatics come around the corner. Oh, and that's the, the, the other thing that, uh, because these the cars come sling themselves around the corner because it's it's a route, it's a route that people drive to work, right? So they do it every day. And you know what people are like? They're like, with the route that they drive every day, they know every gear change, don't they? They know every inch of the road. They know, because they know what lies ahead. It's like a rally. They can, they know what's ahead, so that they know that there's a straight bit ahead, so they can sling it round the corner, knowing that they'll be right on the line uh, for the next bit of road. So they sling cars round this corner. So what happened was I, um, I'm driving to work, and somebody's dumped a concrete block on the corner, and I thought that's a bit, you know, I mean. I thought that someone had just dumped a concrete block and I thought that's a bit off, you know. And then, so I shifted the concrete block and then bugger me, someone put another concrete block there. Anyway, it only turned out that there's this old guy up the road who decided that he was going to try and, I don't know, I don't know what he thought he was trying to do. I think he thought that if the cars coming round the corner knew that they might come into proximity of a concrete block that they might not cut the corner quite so much so anyway I removed a few of them and then he stopped doing it because I had a word with him and said look stop dumping concrete blocks on my corner I've got a funny I haven't had touch wood many accidents on that corner lately, but we used to have quite a few. About five years ago, we had like one every year or two. Someone uh, misjudged uh, it and ended up literally right through our hedge. And which is, that's a pain in the ass because, you know, she was a young girl and she's obviously just an idiot. And uh, she's like, oh, I'll pay you for any damage to the hedge. And I'm like, what are you gonna, what is money gonna do? What can money do for a hedge? that's just had a, a one ton car drive through it, you know? It's gonna be 10 years before that hedge is anything like back to where it was. What are you gonna do? Come round and water it and prune it for me? <laughs> and then there were some young guys, this is like, well, typically Mrs. Angry and I would be in bed and there'd be this massive screech of tires followed by a bang. And you'd, you'd like, you'd be like, we'd look at each other and say, right, someone's piled in again. It was a, it was a bunch of lads in a car, and they'd overshot the, 
uh, crossroads and gone into somebody's garden they're through their fence etc and and uh, the driver had legged it away across the fields so no one could find him and then I'm standing there watching the the car being dragged back out of the garden and turned around and said to one of the blokes standing next to me uh, you know the bloody kids you know thinking he was a neighbor and he said yeah he said I'm, I'm the dad of one of them so obviously he'd been called out so it's not a case of angry foot in mouth disease and what else do we have oh we had a local fireman who came was driving back home heavily in drink and uh, started because the road's a bit bendy and he was going too fast and his reactions were all shot to hell started fishtailing along the road and eventually ended up going straight off the road and unfortunately to him uh, right into a telegraph pole I mean and he must have fit it square on because he snapped it like a matchstick at the base at the base of the pole was just snapped um, it wasn't a telegraph it was a power line actually brought the whole pole down so we didn't hear that Mrs Angry and I slept through that and then in the morning we woke up we got no power so we walked out into the field and then what happens is when when the pole goes down like that they earth the whole line until they get it put back up and um, so we had all our power lines had been uh, staked into the field they use these massive stakes and they must have, I don't, God knows how, they drove these stakes into the ground uh, to earth the, the power line while we were asleep. They, I mean, it was the equivalent of putting up a circus tent in our back garden and we'd slept through it. Anyway. It's another lovely day in paradise. Today's video is being done under clean room conditions by which I mean I have remembered to turn off aircraft mode this is being recorded in aircraft mode and it is going to be transferred in aircraft mode onto the computer which is not going to be doing anything else in other words it's not going to be starting up or with me checking on the patients what I'm doing this morning got an inquiry from a new hygienist so we'll have to wait and see what she's like most of the hygienists that we're getting in in East Kent are uh, not a uh, non UK qualified um, they tend to be hygienists who are uh, you know qualified elsewhere usually in the European Union and then they don't not you know, can't be in the European Union because they'd be automatically entitled to work here but they are not entitled to register in the UK let's put it that way and then for some reason they decide that they need the money and they're going to register in the UK etc so they register and then they just uh, ring around and see if anyone's got a hygienist job I think uh, private hygiene jobs are not that common uh, possibly more common in a mixed practice where the hygiene does like um, a combination of uh, private scaling and polishing well let me put it this way what they do is they do all private scaling and polishing however some of it is on NHS patients if you see what I mean not not wink wink NHS dentists bend the rules as usual so um, so they get a lot there's a large number of NHS patients who are told if they want to scale and polish they have to go private and for that sort of volume you do need a hygienist because what you're doing is you're releasing the dentist to do other work which on the NHS he's, he'll have plenty of that privately the dynamics are slightly different privately uh, the way I look at it is that if a hygienist does a scale of polish for which we charge £49 so say 50 to make it round figure and then supposing they're on 50% then um, you know, I'm losing 25 quid. That's the way I look at it. Now, the, the reason why you might not look at it that way is that you might say, well, in the time it takes me to do a scan and polish, or 
of two or three scale and polishes I could be doing a, a bridge prep for which I could make 1200 quid so that's the whole point of the hygienist is to take the lesser paid work off your hands but there's not do you know what I mean it's not <laughs> as a private dentist your hands really shouldn't be so full that you're working like that excuse me one minute <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, you should never be too busy to do a scale and polish or that if you've got a good hygienist who's a sort of a quasi periodontist that um, let's just see if I can line up there. no that you shouldn't refer you know perio to someone who sort of can take on a more holistic approach to the periodontal needs of the patient it's just that um, it's, if the dentist can do the scale and polish, it's far more effective, uh, cost effective for the bottom line if they can do it themselves. And you know, I mean, obviously, it's more, more cost effective. The dentist can do everything himself, especially if he's the practice owner. So, um, we're going to need to be quite a bit more busy before we think about taking on a, a hygienist over and above the minimal. Uh, amount we have. We have um, the hygienist, the hygienist is coming in today and we get a few complaints because she's only in on certain days and sometimes people can't make those days. We get a few, we're getting a few complaints like I had someone in the other day who wanted a Invisalign type, a small line type clear orthodontic aligners and um, you know she said she, <laughs> she said oh I've had this quote you know it cost her 250 quid because it does uh, for you should have this quote for Visline and it's about four thousand something, four thousand pounds. So I said, well, I think uh, we could probably come in a bit below that because we use the same system, but instead of being in the, based in the states, it's based in Sheffield, with a concomitant decrease in overheads costs. <laughs> so you get it at Sheffield prices, not Los Angeles. So she said, yeah, yeah, I did suspect that, you know. So I said, but the, the, uh, but the bad news is that in order to, you know, obviously the cost depends on the number of clear aligners that you need, and that can only be assessed by the technicians in Sheffield who will need to have some moulds of your teeth and, and uh, do a lot of computer treatment planning. It probably takes them 10 minutes, but anyway, they charge, again, they charge 250 quid for it. So. I said you'd have to pay your 250 quid again, but it's likely that you'll more than get that back because the cost of the treatment would be less. She said, oh yeah, 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 she said, that all makes sense. But she said, but you don't do Saturday mornings, do you? And I said, no, we don't. And she said, and you don't do like late evenings or anything, do you? I said, no, we don't. She said, oh, well, that's, that's the problem, she said there, because, you know, obviously I find it difficult to get time off work. So, well, you know, I mean, I don't know, I didn't really know how to cope with that because one one bit of me, obviously I'm completely sympathetic to people who have trouble, trouble getting time off work. I mean, I have trouble getting time off work. I have to organise it, like, as, as all dentists do, I have to organise it like days or weeks in advance. And, uh, you know, I'm losing money, you could argue, although the work does tend to get done on the other days. And um, so I've got a lot of sympathy with her. But then on the other hand, I'm, I'm offering her something for two and a half thousand, say, that she's got a quote for four. So who in their right mind would say, no, I'd rather pay four and come in on a Saturday morning? You know, I know these people are just thinking out loud, really. She was not, you know, she was just mulling it over in her mind and it just happened to be coming out of her mouth. But. I'm not, that is a bit of a no-brainer, you know? Just uh, take some time off work. I mean, we do appointments at 8.30 in the morning. These things only take 15 minutes. It's not, you're gonna be an hour late, do you know what I mean? Anyway, we'll wait and see if she comes back. 
we've had a couple of cases with the with the smile line I must say it's not been tolerated as well as I thought it would we haven't taken a case through to completion yet I've been along and been entertained by Dr. Shadru the UK's funniest dentist or most influential dentist according to dentistry magazine that's a thing that's a funny thing that UK the top 50 dentists in the UK old Julian English's poll it's the poll of the top 50 dentists who give a toss about getting up to number one in the poll and let me tell you it's got nothing to do about being influential it's not a meritocracy it's all about how many people you how many followers you've got who will vote for you if you ask them and of course the uh, the singing dentist has got a big following a big following and of course they'll all be you know quite happy to vote for him in dentistry's top 50 and so he's at the top that's great and I think David Cameron was in there as well for some reason I just I do not know what's going on with that poll honestly I think they just thrown throwing a pair of dice for some of them and I'm embarrassed because they put me on the list so there are no way I mean 20 years ago i uh, yeah but not now no Top 50 philosophers in dentistry, yes. Top 50 most influential, no. So, but they put me on the list because I always used to be on the list. And then, then I, if I don't, I don't think I even get one vote. I will be amazed. Julian, if you're listening to this, if I got one vote, please let me know. You don't have to tell me who it is even. Just, just tell me if I even got a vote. Because if I didn't, then please take me off the effing list. I don't want to be, I don't want to be on the radar. So yeah, so uh, this uh, Invisalign, smile line thing, we had two cases so far. One of them um, was a was a young woman in her thirties who, uh, with young kids, and wanted some lower incisor straightening but said straight away that it was just too much you know she got enough on her plate with um, life without having to have something in her mouth all day every day because you keep it in except for cleaning your teeth and eating and it just wasn't comfortable you know she just didn't find it comfortable and then the other the other was a young guy who um, you know, quite a affluent son, you know, comes from an affluent family, got plenty of money of his own, decided that he just wanted to spend a bit of money on having some nicer teeth. And so um, uh, we made him, you know, he went through the whole thing, we did the planning, we gave him some trays just to try in, see if he liked them. And this may be a clue, you know, because th that is, they do say, look, you know, we do the um, the planning and everything, but we, if the patient says that, yeah, they're happy to go ahead, the first tray that they ask them to wear is not an active treatment tray. It's just supposed to be a completely passive tray. And the system works quite well because if they wear the passive tray and they don't get on with it full time, then you can give them 10 tubes of whitening gel and say, um, they just treat it as a whitening tray, you know? So they've spent their 250 quid, you've paid, I don't know, half of that to the lab, and then and you've had to give away 10 tubes of whitening gel, which is about 50 quid's worth, so you just about break even, and they've spent 250 pounds on some whitening, so they're not totally unhappy, and the lab's, lab's happy because they're making 125 quid for 10 minutes treatment planning, but not as much as they could have made if um, if the treatment had gone ahead. I'm wondering if the passive trays are a bit too, um, I, uh, well I wouldn't say not too tight because I think they make them as tight as they make the active trays so in a way that is good practice for the patient to understand how tight they are but I just wondered if they get better take up on their treatment if 
they made the passive trays a bit of a looser fit, then they wouldn't get so many people coming back and saying, no, nah, I don't like it. But this guy, he was over the moon with it all, went away, was wearing it, went away with it in, fine, day one fine, day two fine, day three rang up and said they, they're making me chuck up. Which is odd, isn't it? Because like this, the gag reflex is something that you think of as being able to overcome. You don't, you don't not have a gag reflex and then suddenly get one. You have a gag reflex when you're born and then suddenly lose it. So I'm explaining to him, yeah, you know, you might want to persevere with it. And he's like, no, 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 no good, no good. Just make me chuck up. So to the extent where I just sort of wondered whether he was, I oh, know, I know I'm angry, but I am also cynical. And you know, you never ever take patient's word at first hand, you know. Always try and think. Because people are people are bloody liars. They are. They they are. This is the thing, and this is what all this CCTV and uh, covert recording is finally bringing into the public consciousness that most people lie through their teeth all the time especially patients you know oh have you used these closing tablets oh yes oh have you um do you brush your teeth twice a day oh yes do you floss your teeth oh yes anything they'll say they'll say what you want to hear that that is a human being's first reaction when they're talking to anyone is and being asked a question is what does this what does this person want to hear from me you know how am i going to ingratiate myself with this person with my response or more likely how am I going to minimize the amount of aggro that I'm going to get from this person with my response you know do I want to be nagged about my brushing no therefore I will say that I brush because saying that I don't brush means I'm going to get nagged so that's why I don't really take any notice of some what anyone tells me about their brushing I, what I do is I check in with disclosing solution and that tells me whether they brush. And then if I then go on to ask them if they brush, it's because I want to find out whether they are lying or not. Because <laughs> I know the answer. So if you don't brush and then you tell me you do, I know what sort of person you are. I know how much reliance to place on your answers to other questions I may ask. Right, well, it's a gorgeous day shame to be stuck inside but that's the life we lead isn't it life of the miner the care is minor always stuck underground anyway nice to have a chat i'll um, see you tomorrow bye